After you explain Mairuv, Shachris, and the three parts of Shachris, Sukkot de Zimra, Kriyashma, and Shmoin Asrei, then he said that the highest Avaidah is Avaidah Mincha, because Mincha is right smack in the middle of the day. And it's not about the time, it's not a matter of Technically speaking, oh, this is in the middle of the day. It's about the about the person where when it comes to chakras, it's easier to be involved in spirituality because you haven't started your involvement in Gashmias. And at night, it's easy to be involved in spirituality because you finished your involvement with Gashmias. But <clears throat> when it's Mincha time, and you know that up until now you were involved in Gashmis, and after you finished Ava Mincha, you're going back to your involvement. And for that sort of moment, whether it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, to be able to let go and immerse yourself completely, that is the ultimate Aveda. And now he says that this is also <clears throat> something which can be applied on a larger scale in the lifespan of a person, the Hina. Yesh no avoy the klolis, the gimel tefillas. In a more, in a larger scale, we have these three tefillas, which is shachris, mincha, and arvis. The klolis chaye adam in the lifespan of a person. Tefillas shachris, the davening of shachris, the bimei hayaldus, the habachris. When a person is a child, going to cheder, or talking about men, when the Maimon was said, a bocher was going to yeshiva, shahilach, or cheder, the gail of them the As the sailor was, that people picked themselves up, and they traveled to another city to study Torah, not only because there's no yeshiva in their city, but even if there was a yeshiva in their city, people would make an effort to travel someplace else because it says, Have you came to You should wander, I meaning go away to study in a place of Torah. And the reason for that is because in order to succeed in Torah study, a person has to be able to detach himself from all those things that could be disturbing and getting in the way. So you want to get away from all your personal. Uh, involvements so they don't interfere. So by physically, geographically leaving my place and going to a new place, it helps me psychologically to let go of my old place and going to a new place. So there's an Indian of heavy Gaelum came to the Yeshiva, the Limud Basmada, and to learn diligently. This is the way things were done in all Torah communities. Veinze Pelaklal is nothing unique about it. There's nothing shocking about it. It's the norm. Zehu, Chaymas, Gabra, this is the normal way, the normal responsibility. Every year, the Lamad is B'nai Torah. Every father has an obligation to teach his son Torah. So therefore, he would send his son to the Cheder, a little bit older, send him to Yeshiva. And this was the norm. And also, the student. Kolechad Mukhivulumad, he himself has this personal obligation to learn Torah. <clears throat> so this is the norm. Before I start getting involved in my other things in life, I spend my time learning Torah. Twilas Arvis, what is Mayrib in the larger scale? Kashabor and Bisharim, when a person is older, and then he's no longer so much involved in his gash music and business and other involvements. And then he is spending much more time studying Torah and doing mitzvahs. This is also not a wonder. This is also not something so unique. The Kachi Amida, this is the norm. That now that you're free from other obligations, 
what will you do with your time? Now you have the opportunity to spend more time to learn Torah and do mitzvahs. Omnum, nevertheless, Tvilis ha-mincha hu kasher odam be-emtza shneisa. Mincha of a person's life is when a person's in his middle years. Where he's sayed, b'chol inyon ye'elam. And he's young, and there's a lot of fire and excitement and passion and all sorts of worldly things. People have dreams and ideas and goals. The tirdas are sokim. And all is in Yanam of business and Parnasa, they are very disturbing and weigh him down. Hanagas b'nei Beisai, things that need to be done because he's running a family, a home with, uh, with children that he has to guide them and help them grow up. So his mind is very much into other things besides just learning and davening. Then, he has to be able to discipline himself and break those character traits and those desires and passions that he has to things outside of Torah mitzvahs and to see to it that that his conduct should be according to Torah mitzvahs. This is the true Aveda. But in order to be able to succeed, we have first a time period where we're totally immersed, and then we can see can su succeed later to be involved in the world and then at the same time be connected to Hashem. It's a little bit like if you look at the at the general history of the Yidden. So we are uh, we know that that uh, after the Yidden went out of Mitzrayim, they spent 40 years in the desert. The simple explanation to why they spent 40 years in the desert was a punishment. Really, they were supposed to go into Eretz Yisrael right away. But because they sent the spies, and the spies incited them not to believe in moisture that they're going to be able to conquer the land, so the punishment was that they stayed in the desert. But of course, it's all Hashgacha Pratis, and there's a deeper meaning and purpose behind it. So one of the ways that it's explained is exactly this point. The difference between the desert and Eretz Yisrael, and this was the deeper reason why the spies didn't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. They were not ordinary people. They were leaders. They were tzaddikim. They were people who were, each one was the leader of a shevet. And Moshe Rabbeinu chose them because of their righteousness. So what does it mean? They just decided they didn't want to go into the land. There's a lot of, a lot of my marim. Each rabbi in his generation spoke about this story and expanded on it and explained it in depth. But the general idea was that the life in the desert compared to the life in Eretz Yisrael was like being in Gan Eden or being down here. In the desert, they saw godliness open, which means every day food fell down from Shemaim, an open miracle. The clouds are surrounding them, open miracles. The clouds straighten out the earth where, they were, where the earth wasn't straight. The cloud killed snakes and scorpions. So that was open miracle. What about their clothing? It miraculously grew along with them, miraculously was cleaned. So basically everything, how did they have water in the desert? Again, another miracle. And there was a Be'er Hashem the, the, um, the well that came in the merit of Miriam and it traveled with them. Wells don't usually travel. A well is a hole in the ground and it's stuck where it is. And this well went along with them. So basically it's not just they had everything so comfortable, didn't have to work hard. We're talking about a spiritual thing that there was there was godliness revealed. And I don't know if everybody was in the class when we spoke about it. That wait a second, being that this went on for 40 years, 40 consecutive years, nobody looked at this as a miracle anymore. It's just the norm, but it's not true. Because even though it was the norm in the desert, but outside of the desert, all over the world, it still wasn't the norm. So therefore. Every day they were able to see that this is a miracle from Hashem. So they saw godliness open. And now they're going to go into a lifestyle, which is a different lifestyle. The lifestyle that they have to do everything in the natural order. Go to a field, to plow the field, plant seeds, do all the Aveda that it takes to work in a field. And everything that's happening is more or less in the natural order. 
And that's why they did not want to go into Eretz Yisrael. They loved their bubble. Where they were in a spiritual bubble. So why were they, if Hashem doesn't really want that, why were they in a spiritual bubble? So the answer is, after the spiritual bubble of 40 years, we have 3,000 and almost 300 years of Aveda in a natural world. As a preparation for those 3,000 and so years, Hashem first gave us this 40 years of preparation. We, we were immersed in spirituality in a way like never before, never after. And that gave us the strength that later we can be balanced. So on a smaller scale, that's like we have every week. We have, I told you, Shabbos is a day we're totally immersed. So the days of the week, we can keep the balance. And for a person in his personal life, the youth, that is the time where we can immerse ourselves completely. We don't have any other, any other concerns on our head. And that's a preparation that later in life we'll be able to mincha, be able to do what it takes to keep that balance. These are the four tikkunim of the shechina. Mita, going back to the original in the Maimer about the four pieces of furniture, the bed, the chair, the table, and the menorah. All those other davening, that's a preparation for mincha. What? What's the four? Yeah. Because there's three in Shachar Salon. Sukkot is Zimra. Then there is Krishma. Then there is Shmonesra. And Mayrib is one. I know a day his bonus and now the Krishma Shalamita. First, his bonus Krishna Shalamita, which is preparing that tomorrow's day should be the proper day, make an accounting. And the brachas of the Shema and the Shema and the Shema in Esra, and all this is to think about Hashem and how it applies to me. After going through all that, he reaches the Aveda to a Mincha that he can dive a Mincha and he perceives it the right way. What does he perceive? Even his natural seichel, not the godly seichel, his natural seichel, the neichel of the Nevesh of Bahamas, will tell him, will dictate the Cain Tzarech Lies. That's the way you're supposed to live. After all the thinking of Shachris and Berchus Krishna and Shema, his perspective changes, that even the animal soul in him starts seeing things where the godly soul sees it, that the primary thing in life is your connection to Hashem. And everything else is secondary. And the success in everything else is only as a result of my connection to Hashem. And that gives him the strength that he can have a mincha properly. Which mincha? Either mincha in the literal sense, davening mincha in the middle of the day, or the davening mincha um, on the larger scale, which is Davening Mincha, the, the, the time in my life where the person's passions are on high and nevertheless be able to integrate that together with Yiddishkeit and realize what's primary and what's secondary. I was thinking of an interesting example of what it means when he says here that when we daven, ultimately, we want the seichel anushi, the natural seichel, which is perceive things the way the seichel of the key sees it. So I don't know if you paid attention to this, but I thought uh, maybe this is one of the things the mind means. We had the Shabbaton, the Shabbos. So we had Rabbi Professor Bush speak at Mitzvah Shabbos. He told the story of the Boshantiv, right? Those who were there heard the story. Boshantiv left three times. And then he explains why he left three times, called this older couple, and they described how they were dancing. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, the girls from Achon understand what he's talking about. But there are people here that never heard of the Baba Shantu. What in the world is he talking about? He's laughing by a male 
And they're dancing by their table. Explain. Explain that Roshamta had Ruch HaKodesh. And he could see with a vision that normal vision can see. And he saw with his vision what they were doing in their house. And that's how he knew what was going on. He didn't explain it. <laughs> didn't. <No. laughs> and I'm thinking, and, and I'm actually cringing. What are the parents going to think? What is he talking about? So what, what does it mean? What I was thinking to myself was, I'll tell you what it means. There was a time in his life, like you said, that he was just like everybody else. He didn't know anything about Yiddishkeit, didn't know anything about spirituality, Baal Shem Tov. Now, it's 40 something years later, it became so normal to him, so natural to him, so posh to him, that it didn't even dawn on him that he has to explain it. That's an example that the Seichel Amnushi in a person gets so transformed, it thinks like the Seichel Alaki. That's my observation. Okay. Being a east of Zahar, it says in the Zahar, this is the conclusion of the Maimon. Asiya Le'eva. This is a quote that's brought down very often in Chassidus. Asiya Le'eva means Asiya, action, that's above everything. That through action, because we're talking so much about thinking and about feeling and about perceiving, but the bottom line is Maisa B'Payo. Through action, Magim, Mepchines, Madeg, Bezu, person could reach a level it appears that the greatest virtue, the greatest value is being intellectual and understanding and the more you understand naturally, the more you will reach higher levels of spirituality. So he's saying, but the truth is that it's possible through my subapayal, through action to reach levels that are higher than the levels that people could reach through learning and understanding and comprehending. Because the dedication and the commitment to Maisa B'Payal, to action. And this is what it means when she said, let's make a little apartment in the attic. We'll put a table, a chair, and the menorah and a bed there because there's a godly man that comes. And as he explained, the godly man on a personal level is Ruach Tara, the spirit of purity. And we want that spirit of purity to have a place to be. What does it mean? It should be Yashvus Vigili. We all have that spirit of purity. It's not something which is unique only to Tzadikim. Just like Moshe Rabbeinu has it, the simplest Jew has it, and even a Jew who is not only simple, but chas v'sholem, not even keeping Torah mitzvahs, he also has it. But it's makif, which means it's hidden, it's concealed, it's not something which is revealed, and not something which is settled in the person. So how do we have it that should be settled? And therefore it says, nasana aliyas kirktana. He's putting the emphasis on one word, the word nasa. Literally, it means let us make a, a little attic and all these pieces of furniture. So he's saying the NASA, which stands for Asiya action, that's the most important part. Because we know that it's possible, especially for a person that is brilliant and intelligent, to get so carried away with the learning and the understanding and the feeling. And as a result of that, not to be so focused on the action being so perfect and so exact, because the main thing is the feeling. The main thing is the understanding. This is no, the main thing is Asiyah. By having Abbas Yisrael on a practical level, which means actually doing a favor to another Yid, helping another person, making another person happy. Bringing a guest into your home. And this comes with when you do achnosos archim, you involve your physical body. You involve your physical body in the sense that you are doing physical things. Like it says by Abramavini, he ran to get the meat and he ran to get 
uh, the the other things, the the, the the ox around to get the mustard physically ran around because that's after Sarchim. When a person does it with the right intentions, through this, you reach the highest level because the word nasa, asiya, which is action, that sort of comes even before all the four things. This is higher. And by through this and through this only, we fulfill the purpose of Bria Sailam. The, the purpose of creation that Hashem wanted a dwelling place in this physical world. And the dwelling place comes about through physically doing Torah and physically doing mitzvahs. In fact, that's really the way it is in halacha. Imagine a person who really, truly understands godliness and meditates on it and really, truly feels love for Hashem. But for whatever reason, as a result of that, doesn't actually do certain mitzvahs. Then you have another person who knows nothing and fails nothing, but he actually does the Maisa mitzvah. In Hashem's eyes, this person is higher, the one who does the action. So we're not talking about someone who doesn't do mitzvahs, but he's, the, the, the two things that he's comparing is, is a person who is into the thinking and the feeling and not so focused on maybe doing the action the proper way or making sure not to miss something or a person who's dedicated to the Maisa. And that's what counts the most. So this week fulfilled the purpose of creation. This is the pure vessel, the Kabbal, to receive not just the Shechina, but when you receive the Shechina, you also receive Shefa, Bracha, El Yaina. You receive uh, sustenance from Hashem and Bracha from Hashem in all three things, which includes everything in life. Bona, Chaya, Mezayna. Children, life, which means health, and Mezayna, and, and, and sustenance. So a lot of the stories of the Bashemta, like this story that, that uh, we just mentioned, and most of the other stories was that in the times of the Bashemta, it was simple Jews. And these simple Jews, they uh, were God-fearing, but just had no knowledge. And because they had no knowledge, they were ignorant of Torah. And the scholars in the generation would laugh at them, make fun of them. And there were all sorts of uh, jokes that people enjoyed on their account about the mistakes that they made. You know, where this Shabbos is a special Shabbos. Besides being Shabbos of Archim, it's a Shabbos that we start reading one of the four parshas. You probably learn about it that there are going to be four Shabbosim from now until Pesach, that we're going to take out another Torah scroll and read an extra parsha. One of those parshas is called Parsha Zachar. You know what it is? Parsha Zachar? Zachar means we read a Torah that says, remember what our Malik did to you. Not a Haftorah. We read the Chumash where it says, remember what our Malik did to you. And we read this in preparation to Purim because a Malik, a common was, was a Malik. And it's a mitzvah to erase the memory of a Malik. So therefore the Shabbos before Purim, we read Parsha Zachar. So just to give you an example, this is one of the jokes that used to circulate that in this, they had a separate shul. The ignorant Jews weren't even allowed to step into the shul of the scholars. They would walk in, somebody would be kind enough to say, excuse me, you don't belong here. This is a school, a shul for scholars, not for ignoramuses like you. It's hard to believe, because you're not allowed to embarrass other people, but they felt that this was part of a campaign to promote Torah study by embarrassing people who don't study Torah. And unfortunately, they had to leave the shul. So they had their own shul. The only problem is, imagine a shul of ignoramuses, nobody knows exactly what you're supposed to do. So a lot of mistakes were made, and they would make fun of those davening. So came to Shabbos Zohar, they walk into shul the morning, they see on the calendar at Shabbos Zohar, and everybody asks one another, so what are we supposed to do? What's Zohar? This one doesn't know, that one doesn't know. Now one person says, I know, Today we're supposed to read the parsha where it says Isha Kisazria 
the yolad of zachar. If a woman gives birth to a zachar to a male baby, zachar. And everybody says, "Whoa, you're such a scholar. You have to leave the shul. You don't belong. You graduated from the shul." <laughs> and these people were making fun. They made fun of them, and the Shemto was the one who lifted them, lifted their spirits, and he emphasized this nekuda that these are people who makayim mitzvahs. They do mitzvahs with sincerity. They do mitzvahs with 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 uh, pure faith, and in many ways, their mitzvahs are greater than the people who unfortunately aren't so dedicated to the action, but they're more dedicated to the learning and the understanding. Who would lead this person in this life? Who was their leader that they act like this? It wasn't just one leader. There was just, there was just a, general, a general, I'm sure there were people who were very different personally, but generally speaking, that was the atmosphere. There were a lot of people like that. Yeah. Now there's a story, just to give you an example that I told you, I think, in Tishrei time. And it's one of the stories that the Basham told to bring out this point. And that story is that he once heard from Shamayim that there's a Jew who lives in a nearby city, that his davening is greater than your davening. That's what he was told in his dream. Now he knew what his davening was. And he knew how much he helped people that were sick become healed, couldn't have children, have children, couldn't find marriages to get married, and all the brachas through his davening. And now he's told that there's a Jew in the other town that his davening is even more precious to Hashem than the Baal So he went to find out who was this Jew. He inquired, and he found the person and turned out to be, Baal said, it's one of these Jews who was actually an ignorant Jew, simple Jew. And he had a conversation with him. And then he said, by the way, could you tell me, like, how do you daven? And he got blushed a little bit and said, the truth is, I really don't know how to daven. But because I don't know what to say, I want to make sure I don't make any mistakes. So every day, I daven the whole sitter from cover to cover. Which means every day the Shachris, Musaf, Neila, and Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Sheva Brachas, Slichas, everything we do all different times of the year, he would do that every single day. Can you imagine how many times he pronounced Hashem's name in vain because he's not supposed to say these things today? That was his, that was his davening every day. And the Bashem Tev is thinking, and his davening is more precious than my davening. But being that he's here already, the Baal Shem said, you know what, I'm here now, let me teach you how to daven. He took a little piece of paper and made bookmarks, and he showed him, this is only on Shabbos, this is only on Rosh Chodesh, this is only Yom Kippur Rosh Hashanah, this is only for Sheba Brachas, this is only for Slichas, this is only for Bris, and this is only for Pidin Aben, and he made bookmarks, and the whole city should know what you do every day and what you do on special occasions. The person is very grateful. Nobody ever took the time to teach him, to show him anything. He took the sitter with all the bookmarks and he put it on a bookcase. And the Vashem Tev left and he went outside, said goodbye. And Vashem Tev continued in his uh, going home. And he walks back into his apartment. And a little while later, by mistake, he bumped into the bookcase. The sitter fell down. And all the bookmarks fell out. And he was beside himself. Finally, someone had Rahman on him and showed him how to daven. And now it's all lost again. So he quickly gathered all the bookmarks. And he grabbed the sitter and he ran and chased after the Baal And he sees him from the distance and he's screaming, Rebbe, Rebbe, Rebbe. He doesn't hear him. He's running after him. Baal is moving the head. And then he sees from the distance that Baal comes to a lake. Hashem who conducted himself in his miraculous way, pulled out a handkerchief, spread it out on the water, and he stood on the handkerchief and he went across the other side of the lake to go home. He was so simple that he thought that I guess that's what you're supposed to do. So he also, when he came to the lake, he pulled out a handkerchief, spread it out on the water, and he stood on the handkerchief, actually, and he got across the other side of the lake. And he finally catches up to Moshe and is out of breath. 
I say, Rebbe, the Siddur, you gave me the bookmarks. It all fell out. All the pieces all over. Please show me again how to dive in. Bashanta looks at him and says, tell me, how did you get on the other side of the lake? So he said, oh, I, I saw what you did. I did the same thing. I put a handkerchief out on the water and I got on it and I went across. So you know what? If that's the case, go home and continue davening the way you daven until now. You're doing just fine. What does it mean? It means that his sincerity and his Yerushamayim and his emes was so amazing that it sort of transcended all those things. He wasn't his fault. He was a he never had an education, so it wasn't even his fault. He can't even say he violated something. And like everything else, is there a source for this in, in Torah somewhere? Yeah, there's a story in Gemara with Rabbi Kiva. And the story was that he once heard somebody davening, and he made this big mistake when he was saying Shema Yisrael, instead of saying Hashem Alakir Hashem Achad, he couldn't read it properly. The Dalad and the rage were confusing to him, and he said Hashem Acher. And the word acher is the opposite of achad. Because in the Chumash, when it talks about all the Zorah, it says, Lo do not bow down, l'keil acher. And here he said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem alakin, Hashem achad. And Rabbi Kiva taught him how to say it right. And because he was saying it the other way, he got all confused, he couldn't concentrate. So it says later that in Shemayim, there was a complaint to Rabbi Kiva. Because they had so much pleasure from his Shema Yisrael, and now you confused him, and now he's not able to say the way he used to say it. So we see that sometimes there are people that are that are able to transcend all the technicalities because of their because of their greatness. But what is what is what did they do? They were mice of a pair. They were action. So even we that we learn and we understand and we're trying to feel, we have to always remember that the most important thing is mice the action, and never should the learning and the feeling interfere with our commitment to, to action. And where do we see it in the Pasuk? The first words, nasana. That is what alludes to this concept. Yes, there's a bed, and there's a table, and there's a chair, and there's a menorah, there's bonanus, meditation, feeling. But what's the first thing, what's the most important thing is nasa, is asiyah. Before we finish the mimer, meaning before we go on to a new mimer or learning something new, I'd like to go through this mimer and make note of all those places where there are terms. Usually when I give you a mimer, I also add a sheet that has the Hasidic terms just to know the vocabulary, so to speak, the Hasidic vocabulary. So something that we pointed out as we're going along, and some of it, we didn't. So I'd like to do that now, when you're walking from the Mimer, at least underline those places where it uses terms which are Hasidic terms. Oh, this yes. Is, is it have, if it needs to be so simple, and so why we learn Hasidu so much, and we, we turn like on the feelings and the love, if it has to be very simple? In the end. So there's, a, so there's a story with the free the Rebbe's secretary. He was a secretary, but he was also one of the deepest minds of Hasidus of that generation. His name was Rabbi And he once said to the Prix de Rebbe that he feels that when it comes to a Shonin and Kippur, the way he feels about it, he said, the way it's described in Hasidus, what a simple Jew is like, I feel like I'm not even a simple Jew. So the Prix de said that, do you think it's so simple to be simple? You understand that? Yeah. <laughs> In other words, if somebody's really a simple-minded person, it's natural for them to be simple. But a for a person who's more intelligent and more developed intellectually, it's much more difficult to have that simplicity. Because he needs to be intelligent. It has to be motivated by the seichel. Otherwise, it's not going to go. Yes. But at the same time, to remember that it has to lead to action. So it's not simple to be simple. Because if you know this, you're not simple anymore. Right. I mean, it, it's interesting because the word in Hebrew for simple is pashat. 
And the word for abstract is also pashit, pshitut, which means something that has no form, no shape, abstract. So it says in the Sikhs that the pshitus, which means the pashtus, the simplicity of the simple Jew, it touches and reaches in the pshitus, in the essence and the core of Hashem, which is also pashtus, no form, no structure, but in, infinite. The word pashtus could mean the infinite in Hashem, and it could mean the simplicity in a person, because that also comes from the part of the neshama, that's the deepest part of the neshama. But the simple meaning of the word is just simple. Okay, so let me point out a few things. So first of all, this in itself, Dalit Tikkun um, Shchinta. Where do they have? Where is the first time he introduces that expression? Is it's on the first page, three lines from the bottom. It says Dalit Tikkun Shchinta, the four Tikkunim of the Shchina. And I guess the word tikkunim means that these are the four things that accommodate the Shekhinah, bring the Shekhinah, or that's what the Shekhinah needs where to dwell, these four things. In this context, it's the four parts of the davening. And then there are other places where it's applied in a different way. Okay. We turn the page. So in the second, in the second um, paragraph, the second line, you have the word cheshben tzedek. So cheshben tzedek means an accounting. Sometimes you have the word cheshben hanefesh. And sometimes it says cheshben tzedek. It's all the same. It means when a person stops to think and make an account of how my day went or how my month went or how my year went. So the word cheshbon means accounting, but the difference is cheshbon and nefesh means accounting of the soul. And we say cheshbon tzedek, it's emphasizing that it should be an honest accounting, which means when a person does think about how am I doing, he should be honest. And it's interesting that in Hasidus it says the honesty is in both directions. Number one, not to exaggerate and think of myself more than I really am, but also not to exaggerate in the negative, and make myself less than I really am. MS is that I recognize the truth, what my qualities are, what my weaknesses are, and the qualities I see as opportunities, and the weakness I see as something that I have to correct. Um, let me see where the next thing is. So on the next page, 131. If you look at two, four, six, eight lines from the top, it says, Anoichi Misha Anoichi. What does that mean? I am who I am. You remember what we said? What, that, what do you mean, I am who I am? Everybody is who he is. Anyone remember what it means? I'm sure you remember, but everyone's being very humble, so I'll, I'll say it. That Hashem has different names. And the names that are the most common is the name Havaya, then there's the name Elohim, there are many other names. And sometimes Hashem is referred to as Anoichi, Hashem says I. So for example, the first words of the Aseris Hadib starts off Anoichi, I am Hashem, God, Elokeichem, your God. I am God, your God that took you out of Egypt. 
So the Zohar says that Elokim or Elokechem alludes to one level. Havaya, another level. And Anoichi, I, means I am who I am, meaning the essence of Hashem. There's no description, there's no definition, there's no way of defining it. It's just the essence of Hashem. And to express that point, the Zohar used the term Anoichi, Mishi, Anoichi. I am who I am. There's nothing more to it, just me, just being me. Let's find one more. <clears throat> so a few lines down the line, it says Lahashkim. It's about 10 lines down. In the middle of the page, we have the word Kabbalah's Oil Malchu Shamayim. So it's a phrase, four words, Kabbalah's Oil Malchu Shamayim. And sometimes you only have the first two, Kabbalah's oil. And this comes up a few times in the Maimer. And it means accepting the yoke of Hashem, which means commitment to Terah Mitzvahs, unconditional commitment, uh, loyalty and dedication. It's not about the thinking and not about the feeling, just commitment to do what it is that has to be done. And one more, which is three lines in the bottom, which talks about what happens when a person sleeps, what happens in a, in a positive way. So it says, when a person sleeps, the neshama ascends to shamayim, the lachayim, and it draws life that actually when a person sleeps, if he goes to sleep in a proper way, then his neshama at, at night goes to a place which is a godly place. And the neshama is filled up with a new supply of spiritual life. And sometimes it expresses itself by the dreams that they have during the sleep. And sometimes it expresses itself in something that happens later in the day when they wake up but they have more of an inspiration. And that's a result of what the neshama was able to absorb at night when it was sleeping. Okay, I'll finish the rest tomorrow, Ms. Hashem, to be continued.